thank you for having me uh, thank you to uh, mx media uh, it's a particular honor to be among such educated and erudite people i've been sitting through a few sessions um, uh, we are a young practice um, but we are a practice that believes that architecture is part of is when one does something that as important as building uh, creating a building or building a structure then one is uh, in a sense responsible much beyond uh, you know codal requirements one is creating a little bit of culture and one is creating cultural objects that people identify with uh, they need to evoke uh, a sense of stakeholdership amongst the user group that is using these buildings um, and to that effect how we go about buildings um, how we plan them how we design them as architects uh, and how we actually end up building them with support from structural engineers uh, is all part of that process so today i would actually like to talk about what steel means uh, to all of us as a constructed cultural object um i don't know if uh, many of you are familiar with this uh, quote by louis kahn was a architect of great repute uh, who asked that um, you know what can a brick be uh, if you think of a brick you say to a brick what do you want and the brick says i like an arch so um, what i think kan was trying to stress was that there is a certain relationship between the creator or the the person who visualizes what a material will do and what a material will behave like um, and that relationship is a two way relationship um, the reason why i start with louis kan is because he made this reference to a something as modest as a brick um, but bricks very often don't necessarily only want to be arches uh, this is our very first designed building um, it was the offices for a south asian human rights documentation center where we found that perhaps bricks if they're not being arches they might uh, prefer being a fabric uh the idea of something that is modular and small and repetitive actually stitching with each i mean masonry being a stitched technology uh is something that we discovered while we were designing this building and that has elevated our thinking about material so once we designed this building and it became a little popular amongst uh, you know it would got published and got some kind of recognition we were labeled as brick architects um now that's a very strange label to have if you are an architect or a designer of any kind structural or architectural because i don't think as people who are part of our professions can ever be prejudiced towards material i think i heard a lot of conversation about concrete versus steel steel versus concrete now technically yes amongst ourselves we talk about this uh but to the person who is actually utilizing our structures who are inhabiting our homes uh the homes that we design who are live you know sitting in offices and hotels like this meeting with each other um they are not that prejudiced against material it is our duty to think of optimum ways to build but it is also our duty to be sympathetic to the way in which we build to be sympathetic towards what the person who is going to use those structures really speaking wants when i mean this is our relationship with built material is formed through a lot of cultural practices so as many of you are aware in the early 1900s there was a movement called modernism across various design fields uh, and it was essentially a move towards structuralism and it was a move towards functionality and as that movement evolved and moved on and changed and the culture around that movement changed and even the cultural anchors of people as it changed and evolved uh, perhaps we were certain we were hunting for something that was beyond just a visual composition of functional volumes which is what architecture has had ended up becoming it had become just envelopes around volumes that housed function it lost that essential nature of being a cultural object um so you had the arguments between the brutalists and the uh, uh, you know the the messian architects who felt that light thin structural steel would express a certain transparency in the structure in the cultural objects that buildings should appear like they are built um 
And on the opposite side, you had people who felt that, you know, the weight of concrete, the form finding abilities of concrete was something that was much more expressive. Uh, but if you move on, over a period of time, you come across the works of an excellent uh, designer, Santiago Calatrava. Uh, Santiago Calatrava was a structural engineer, but he is noted, noted as a brilliant architect. Um, and Calatrava's work, I think, impresses a whole new generation of architects, essentially because the material, his, his ability to use material structurally to express. Um, in Calatrava's hand, steel behaves in a non-mechanical manner. Steel behaves in a poetic manner. Steel perhaps can even fly. The idea of a building material as being an expression of culture or being an expression at all is something that we had worked with uh, when we designed this office for um, an outdoor advertising agency called Pioneer. You may have seen them. They have billboards all over the city, all across various cities. Uh, you know, they had a small plot of land in Delhi where they wanted to build this office. Uh, and typically because we assume that plots of land that are rectangular would naturally have rectangular buildings, uh, one doesn't look beyond that. But the fact of the matter is that if you're a corporate office and you're occupied during daytime, um, lighting and ventilation is at a premium, especially if the plot of land is narrow. Um, so our our process of looking at this project was to try and understand what is the client, really speaking, wanting to say with this building. If it is a corporate headquarter, it bears the identity of the agency or the entity that is housed in it. It goes beyond just being an office floor plate where there is open plan offices laid out. It is an expression of whatever is behind that company. So while we were thinking about what kind of forms would represent best, this idea of identity, we came up with the form of a thumb. Now it seems that it's a very frivolous, almost a very uh, too simplistic an interpretation of what identity can mean. But uh, if you think about it as an outdoor advertising agency, it is that simplicity, that simplicity of getting an identity, of understanding what a brand stands for. That is their realm of uh, operation. Then when you think about the form of a thumb and what it means as a facade and what it means as a volume, you understand that because you have a form of this sort, it allows you to bring in a lot of light and ventilation into the heart of the building, which would have otherwise have to be artificially managed. The reason why I talk about this at a structural steel conference is because it appears to be a metallic building. It was conceived as a building to be made in steel because this sort of a form, a structural form, is better to use something like a steel a member rather than a trebiated member. However, we were, we were uh, hard pressed by our clients in matters of cost, in matters of being unsure about the technology of steel, which is unfortunately a very common situation in our country. So while larger projects, I know Professor Shah showed some of his excellent airports this morning. Uh, larger projects, people understand that yes, if it's an airport or yes, if it is a large span structure or if it's a steel, if it's a bridge, the natural material in their head is steel. And they've started identifying steel with only large span uh, functional structures, functional spaces, not with something as close to their hearts as their offices and their homes. Part of our journey now over the past two years is actually trying to migrate into using steel for its structural qualities, but try and mediate that with its implications on our culture and how we live our lives and our lifestyles as well. Um, we call this building the digit because it represents a digit. It's a thumb. The thumb carries uh, aluminum cladding which protects the glazing behind it. Um, we have perforated that aluminum cladding and reattached our perforations on a pin detail so that it flutters in the wind. And when you drive past this building, uh, it's on uh, Rotak Road, uh, you will notice that periodically the logo of the company forms and disappears through natural wind. Uh, sorry? You've seen it. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, so it grabs your attention, doesn't it? So yeah, so the idea was to create something that would have that kind of visual impact of a billboard. 
that you would see on a roadside. But to make it something, we could have easily done this with a LED screen or something like that. But the idea of using a material that represents uh, what that company is doing and what that identity is. Now I'm talking of here about a corporate identity. When you move into the interiors of the building, that is reinterpreted because that space belongs to the people who work in that company. So we've replaced that, the idiom of the thumbprint with actually a thumbprint in the fall ceiling for doing the lighting. Um, because that perforated metal front of that building becomes such a part of the corporate identity of that uh, company, it allowed us to introduce those perforations as a design aesthetic treatment within the office space to create a very dynamic, young, energetic uh, space to work in. Um, you know, as steel is considered a modern material, we are as a culture uh, essentially a masonry, uh, mason, other than say the eastern part of the country where a lot of bamboo is used. Uh, and architecture is essentially looking at spanning and using the tensile qualities of bamboo. Traditionally, in large parts of this country, it's always been masonry of some kind or the other, uh, stone, brick. And to that extent, we have highly evolved skills in both stone and brick masonry. Um, this is a recent project that we've embarked upon, which we are very excited about. Uh, this is in Varanasi. Uh, our client is a, is a gentleman of, uh, uh, he, he is a Marwadi gentleman who is a businessman in Varanasi, who came to us saying, I want a Haveli in Banaras. But he's a young gentleman, and he wanted to also have his house reflect the fact that he was modern and contemporary, but he was part of a joint family. Uh, these kind of lifestyles, cultural implications of how people live their lives affect architecture and do affect the way structures are designed. Uh, and my, my presentation today is essentially to try and emphasize on that because all of us very often, uh, because it is a huge and onerous task to design and build buildings, we very often lose sight about what the final legacy this building, these buildings that we create will have and what is the impact on all of us and on our communities as uh, uh, the cultural impact of it. So anyway, so when we were under, trying to understand what the structure of a typical Marwadi Haveli is, uh, we understood it as being tiered of reducing load as it goes up uh, and trebiated, basically a post and lintel type of construction. Uh, when we talked to our clients about how uh, they wanted to live and you know, how they like their spaces to be arranged and so on and so forth, we realized that the way they wanted to live didn't really fit into that Haveli model because they were no longer a joint family with a very public ground floor uh, where they were sharing spaces around a courtyard. They were all, this joint family was a joint family that lived together but was segregated. They all wanted their own room spaces and they all wanted to be elevated because the ground floor uh, where they had their public spaces, the living space, the dining space were functional spaces. Earlier, they used to be social spaces. Now the social spaces had sh shifted a floor above. And we realized that our Haveli, really speaking, needed to be an inverted pyramid, purely to, comp to kind of accommodate the kind of volumes that the lifestyles demanded. Their public spaces where they entertained their uh, friends and uh, people who visited them was actually much smaller. Uh, so when we realized this, we, we spoke to our clients about the idea of using steel to build. So initially, of course, I mean, you can imagine in, I don't know how popular steel is in Banaras at the moment, but at least with our clients, there was a lot of misgivings. There were a lot of questions of will it work? How, you know, how, how does steel make sense? Because culturally, the idea of steel had not entered uh, the construction, uh, the idea of construction into the idea of construction. Um, essentially, what we realized was that the ground floor actually required to be as column free as possible and the first floor had a whole collection of rooms. So we actually had to uh, design a structure where the loads were transferred to the side. But because they were being transferred, we were very keen that they weren't uh, sitting on extremely, we were very keen that they should sit on extremely slender members. Uh, the, the floor slab itself could be of, uh, because it would have decking and a concrete slab on it, we could actually accommodate that distribution of load very effectively. 
uh, then comes the idea of idiom now obviously if you if someone comes to you and says that i want a haveli and you give them a long span steel structure uh, they possibly going to be quite unhappy with what you present to them when you talk to clients about what exactly they imagine when they look at a building you'll realize they don't really imagine steel and brick and cement and concrete they imagine a whole the building as a whole and that whole is not just a visual thing it is that building as it is experienced that is touched as it is felt one of the big things that structural steel does to architecture is that it segregates a skeleton from a skin uh, in a in a masonry technique that's not possible to do the moment you segregate a section a, a structure of a building as a skeleton and a skin it allows you a lot more layering and a lot much more complexity on how you develop your designs uh, if the skin is independent of the skeleton you can have a lot better control on how you insulate it what the finish looks like what the detailing is it tends to move modular in terms of how the structure is designed but those are situation those are where the skill of the architect actually comes into play so we've now designed this light filled haveli unlike most havelis which tend to be dingier in their rooms we've uh, designed it with an envelope of a jali on the outside that is mounted onto the steel structure uh, and we are hoping by the end of the year uh, it should be uh, occupiable um we about like i said two or three years back we started working with a lot of steel at a small scale this was one thing that i felt uh, that both my partner and i have ever felt is intriguing if there is a material uh, where excellence of design and excellence of fabrication can only be achieved at a large scale what can we as architectural designers do to kind of introduce it to a smaller scale because i think it's very important for the steel industry to consider what it means to look at steel and its implications at a smaller scale of construction uh, of course there are lots of glitches there is a whole issue of skill labor fabrication uh, but the advantages are much greater uh, precision is one thing more and more materials that are being finished like for example in this building which is also a residence um, we decided to go in for walls that were insulated and have ceramic tiles uh, on the outside uh these are rain this is a rain screen technology this allows this prevents water from seeping into the structure uh but to be able to do this we cannot do it if we were to use build a structure made out of masonry the the precision required could not have been achieved uh so then the material of the finishing starts de demanding this kind of uh precision from the structure um Mr Das had spoken quite eloquently about tubular sections uh, I would highly endorse what he says in as much as I too see a lot of potential especially at the smaller scale of using tubular sections uh, where uh, the repetitiveness of that structure the fact that it is a truss with so many members is something that can actually help because it helps you design your fenestrations better it helps you design your cladding systems better uh you're not shifting material from steel and then aluminum to reduce the span and then cladding it you can actually start thinking in terms of using the structure uh to get much more lighter structures means faster construction it also means lesser time um so we've started doing this and we are experimenting you can see on the uh, on the photograph here uh we managed to introduce a entire floor of glass uh in the middle of the house which allows again a lot of light to penetrate again not possible without an underpinning of steel uh within the house certain parts of the house that so far have always traditionally been thought of as functional spaces but now more and more in residences and commercial spaces they are social spaces a staircase is a very good example uh most houses most buildings tend to treat staircases as fire escapes as super functional spaces uh but these are very expressive this is where families meet this is where you change uh where co-workers meet with each other uh the, the these these kind of elements of the building also need to be expressive uh which is not again possible to do if you were to think of the standard kind of construction techniques uh in this case again because the structure is independent of the uh, of the uh of the skin we were able to design the staircase in a residence 
where essentially the staircase acted as a light fixture. It kind of lit up the entire space and emphasized the importance of it as being the heart of the house. Um, so we have now started gradually introducing elements of structural steel as independent of the rest of the structure. Um, as I move on, I'll show you how more and more is kind of creeping into our work. Um, again, this was a very interesting, this, this in fact was a big mind opener for us in terms of how we think of steel. Uh, uh, the entire structural member over here is a folded plate uh, of steel that has been turned and uses the tensile nature of steel to create a large expansive uh, uh, staircase, uh, which again connects all these floors in a very fluid sort of manner. So the understanding amongst most lay people is that steel is very uh, rigid and it's all right angles and it's all girders and it's all struts. Uh, but actually steel naturally wants to be very fluid. It is a very fluid material. Um, steel helps buildings talk to people. Um, this is a small artist studio that we are designing right now in Noida, um, where because it's an artist studio, um, both the client and us, our um, mandate for the project was that this building acts as, an ex as a place where art can be shared with everyone. Traditionally, art is always locked up in museums and you need to access the museums to access art. So we thought, what if we created an artist studio that was open? that was actually something that people could get glimpses of what is happening on the inside. And actually, eventually, uh, art can be shared as on the facade of the building and that can keep changing with time. So what you see over here are two, we call, like to call them concrete ribbons, but these, um, you know, the, the floor slab becomes the wall, then goes down into the basement, then comes up. And these two flowing ribbons of concrete are contained by a steel structure. Uh, as, a, as an artistic expression, uh, many of us find uh, that there are always systems that support fluidity. Uh, in this design, we realize that the rigidity of a girder side panel, which we needed, and I'll explain why, uh, when it kind of runs through the fluidity of concrete, you actually get some incredibly, um, how shall I say, stimulating spaces. Um, this is what the studio, this is actually, I took these photos just yesterday because I knew I was going to come and talk to you. Um, this is what that artist studio, instead of being a dark, dingy um, gallery, it's actually a volume that is punctured with slivers of light. Um, and the steel structure that supports one side of the building actually runs through it, uh, and I'll show you in places. And when it comes in, uh, what you see on the left is um, actually these massive panels on which art is going to eventually appear. Various artists are going to come and occupy this space. They're going to paint on these walls. And when they flip the panels around after they've finished, it will be a public display of that art. So steel goes beyond uh, just representing um, engineering prowess. I think structural steel, if it well and truly trickles into the building culture of this country, it has immense potential. Uh, since Tata Structura is one of the supporters here, I thought I'd end my talk um, with a design that we'd come up for a competition that they'd organized in 2007. Um, it was called Notions of a Nation. And they wanted a contemporary expression of, uh, sorry, an expression of contemporary India made out of structural steel. Um, this uh, design did not win that competition, uh, but it's something that is very dear to our practice because it was the first time that we really speaking understood how expressive steel can be and how uh, this form of thinking can only be expressed by steel. Um, so when they came to us, uh, when we entered this competition, we read the brief and we realized that what they were talking about was so complicated. How do you represent India? I mean. You can't even win an election and represent India. So it's, it's, it's so complicated as an, as an idea, this country. How can you actually express that with something that would, um, that would remain in people's minds and that they felt? Because one of the big things about being a nation is that 
your citizens feel that they belong to you and you belong to them. Uh, that connection is a very difficult thing to think about. Um, so when we started thinking about it, we, we, we were really trying to conceive of it bottom up and we were wondering what, what exactly constitutes India and what does it mean as a nation. So we realized we were not talking about hierarchies. Uh, it would be interesting to think of structure as hierarchical, uh, as a top-down situation where loads are transferred step by step all the way down into the foundations. Uh, but as a nation, we are not hierarchical. We are a democratic nation. We are actually a holarchy, if one is allowed to frame that term. Uh, as, a, as a country, we are not about our parts. We are about a whole. Uh, it's not about individual identities and objects. It's about relationships bind all of us as a nation. Um, and finally, it's about fragmentation. It's not about breaking things down into different categories. It's actually about creating networks. So my, our sense of what this country means is all this that you see on the right hand side. Then we needed to think about a symbol. A symbol is a very complicated thing also because if a symbol of a nation has to capture what animates people's minds in the moment and in the future simultaneously, you need to future proof such a notion. Uh, so we decided to kind of balance it out with what is it about our country today? Is it about the fact that we are held in dynamic equilibrium? Is it about the fact that we are full of self-belief, that we are exuberant in our aspiration? And does that balance out with other values that are enduring in our nation, which is democracy, pluralism, and the idea of pulling things together, cultural syncretism, allowing influence, and yet remaining in balance? We also understood that being a symbol, it would eventually have to be a sanctum, a kind of a sacred holding place of all the values and all the changing values that constitute the country. It had to be timeless. It could not age. It, it would be as timeless as the nation. And finally and most importantly, for a, for a symbol, we felt if it was a symbol of India, it could not be a spire. It could not be this object, a sculpture that you plant in the middle of a roundabout and then you go around and look at. Uh, you know, most of the symbols that represent India are objects that we look at. We never occupy them. So we thought what instead of creating an object, we were to able to create a space. And what we came up with was a kind of a flowering steel structure. Uh, it is, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a fractal banyan tree, you may call it if you like. But it, what you see is that uh, at the center is the essence of the structure itself. It's um, three hollow sections that are bent. Uh, each color represents a reducing size of that section, but the form is exactly the same. Uh, the connections were to happen uh, by these, uh, this kind of a joinery detail that would have been created out of a lost wax process specifically. Uh, and as it flowered, it would flower back down. Now, we were very concerned whether this would be something that would be stable. Now, we, because we are not technically structural engineers and because this was a design competition and we didn't uh, perceive, I mean, we didn't actually have the ability to hire a structural engineer, we did what good architects do and we decided to model it. Uh, so having created the computer model, we went ahead and decided to create a lower grade, less complicated but a representative model. Uh, and I'm happy to report, so what you see on the right is a model of the same um, design. Um, and what really makes me happy is that it is extremely organic. It is something that is all the things that we wanted out of the design, we got out of it. Uh, the little gold plates that you see on the top are actually meant to be um, stainless steel, uh, uh, plated stainless steel uh, with little LEDs in them so that at night, uh, this entire tree structure would light up and would actually represent uh, the sky, the night sky with its lights uh, in a kind of an indication of where the future of India lay. We called it Kalpavriksh. It's this tree of our dreams. And I'd like to end on that note.